Today, I'll be taking a small webinar on Appium Python automation using remote devices. My name is Christy Babu. I am a part of the Headspin team. I've been working with the company for more than four years now, and I work as a sales engineer. Now, let's dive deep into the webinar itself. Now, for today's agenda, we'll be, I'll be introducing what Headspin is and how the platform can help you in automating any test cases, be it, app, be it using Appium, Selenium, and I'll, I'll also talk about what Appium is and how mobile automation can be done using Appium. I'll even give you a brief setting up of the environment for, I'll be more or less leaning towards Linux and Mac devices. Now I'll also show you a small Appium test script that's written in Python. We'll also be uh, going through how you can use the same test script to connect to any remote device that's available in Headspin as well. And after, at the very end, we'll even have a Q&A session. So let's start. So Headspin is a digital experience AI platform. Here are the four major pillars that we abide by. One is a global device infrastructure, wherein we have real devices. These are actual devices, like Android or iOS devices all across the world. We have our presence in around 100 plus locations using a physical box, which is called the P-Box. I'll show you how that looks like in the next slide. And using that, you can run any test cases written in Appium or even test cases written in Tosca, Leapworks, which are, which are low-code solutions. Now, the second pillar would be test automation and APIs. So you can run any scripts uh, you're using any language, as long as it has an Appium client uh, in, readily available. You can run that particular script on the remote devices. You can even use uh, some of the APIs that we provide to even connect the remote devices to your local device so that you can run test cases by using Espresso or even XUI test cases on iOS as well. And once you run those test cases, the third pillar comes into effect. That is performance, quality of experience, and machine learning. Here, you can run any test case on the number of devices that we have, be it parallel or even manual test cases, and you can get insights and even device level metrics captured over there, like say net CPU usage, memory use, or even battery drain, which can further help you to improve the application which you are working on. And the last pillar would be insights into the actions. So once your scripts are ready and you're running it on the devices that we provide, we can give you insights into those particular scripts, like if there's uh, too much loading, that occurs while the test case is being run, or if there's a specific API that's failing at a particular point of the test case. Now, this is the physical P-Box that we use to connect those real devices to the platform. So the P-Box itself contains three different hosts. It can be a mixture of three Linux or three Mac minis, or even a mixture of both. So once the hosts are set up, you can connect your devices directly to the P-Box. Now we have different deployment methods, which I, I won't be talking about. And this is how the overall UI uh, looks like. Here you can interact with the device, uh, do your testing over here. And we even have something called as an AV box, which is basically two different devices. Uh, one device would be using its camera to be, uh, using its camera to record the content of a video on another device. This is majorly used for any DRM content. Now, I'll give you a quick overview of what Appium is and the advantages of using Appium for mobile test automation. So Appium is an open source automation tool, which means you can use it to run any scripts as long as it has uh, an Appium-based client involved. So in Python, we have an Appium Python client, which you can use to write your scripts. You can use locator strategies, which I'll talk about in the next slide. In the next slide. Uh, with which you can write, run any automation uh, scripts or any automation frameworks, unit test cases, or even PUM model, which is page object model, or even BDD frameworks on any Android or iOS based devices. It, it supports native, hybrid, and mobile web applications as well. That means even if it's a production application that's installed on your a device, or even if it's a hybrid application, which is a mixture of web based as well as the native application or even mobile web application, which is essentially the browser based applications. Now, the advantages of Appium is its cross platform. That means you can write your script on any Android device, and even if it's another on any Android model, and you can run the same script on other models as well. If it's iOS, you can run write your script on an iPhone 11 and uh, get the script running on iPhone 13 and 14. There might be a few element changes that might be needed, but more or less you'll be able to run 
run it on the different devices. You just have to run it for, uh, you have just have to create a script for one Android and one iOS. There's no source code modification. So you can basically run, you can use just one code and give it to any of your friends that has the same app in line and they can run the same code on their device as well. Now, the advantage of Appium is that it does support different languages. So I've mentioned it in the previous slide. You can use Python, JavaScript, Ruby, Java, to name a few uh, languages. So I'll be more or less working with Python for this particular demo. And it utilizes, it utilizes the web driver protocol, which again, I'll talk about during the actual scripting process. Now, the first thing to do is to set up your environment. So Appium requires you to have two major components. One is the Appium client, which helps you, which helps the script that you've written in a particular language to interact with the Appium server, which is the second component. Now the Appium server helps you connect that particular script to the real device or even a simulator. Now in the demo that I'm showing you, which I'll show you in a second, would be more or less leaning towards the remote devices, not for the local, so Appium can be, you can even connect your device uh, to your laptop uh, and even run the Appium server so that you can run the same script which you've written for the remote device on the local device as well. I'll even show you an example of how the Appium server looks like. Now, uh, for Mac, for someone that's using a MacBook or even a Linux-based uh, operating system, you can directly install the client by just typing pip install Appium Python client. Make sure pip is installed first, which is a Python client. Then you can configure the Appium server just by installing and installing Appium using npm install minus t Appium. Now you also have to make sure not.js is also installed. These are prerequisites. And you can directly run the Appium server just by typing in Appium. You can also uh, set up the Appium with the GUI as well. That means it's a with a graphical user interface. So here is an example of how the Appium server looks like. If I just pause this and exit. So this is a simple setup where you, you can just type in the host and the port number in which the device is connected to. And you can just click on start server and it automatically starts the Appium server. Now, when you run the script, it will directly connect to this particular, uh, it won't directly connect. You'll have to give the host URL as well. Again, I'll talk about when the scripting actually starts. And that's how you can connect to the uh, remote devices. Now, I'll show you how the script looks like. The one that I'm gonna show you is a Python-based code, which is written in unit test case. So this is how the code looks like. Now, since it's a unit test case, I've just imported the unit test case uh, using the import function. You can directly import that. You don't really have to install anything other than that. And I'll show you what the imports are. The second import would be sys. This is majorly used to get any system variables onto the script itself. Since we are running it on a remote device, you can quickly run the same script on different devices. The only two major different uh, changes that you'd have to make is to change the device ID as well as the web driver URL, which will help you to connect the remote device with the code. Next, I'll be importing options. So in the new Appium, Appium gets updated uh, frequently. So in the new uh, Appium uh, update, you'd have to use something called as uh, options. So normally in the previous uh, scripts, you would have to use something called as reside capabilities that has been deprecated right now. So you just have to add those capabilities into something called as options and you can run the same script. Then I have imported Appium by, which is again a tool that is used to kind of, uh, kind of, uh, run the particular element strategies. Then we have a driver wait, which essentially uh, helps you wait for a particular element for a particular amount of time. I've set that up in the script as well. Then there's something called as expected conditions. So this is a Selenium based, uh, uh, it's a bit of a Selenium based tool, not just Appium. So what this does, what this function does is you can use uh, certain keywords like wait for element to be, wait for element to be uh, visible, or we can even use something all as uh, wait wait for the element wait for the presence of the element to be located as well. Okay, uh, I'll answer the questions right after the slides, uh, Mohammed. Okay. Now next would be uh, I've also imported time dot sleep. This is just to wait for uh, a particular action to occur. Now since I've written the whole test case using unit test, it basically has three components. One is setup. The second part is the test itself, which is uh, always 
start, which is always written with test at the initial of that particular function name. And then there's the teardown. Now, that unit test case works in a way where the setup right, is uh, started at the very beginning of the test case. And it will be, it will have the capability list and also the post URL, which connects to, to that particular remote device. And then the test starts. So in this particular test, I've uh, basically opened the settings app of the uh, Samsung device and clicked on connections. And I'm just turning the Wi-Fi toggle on and off. That's pretty much it. I'll also show you how you can get the locator strategies as well. And once the test case is over, you can have multiple test cases as well. As long as a function starts with the keyword test in it, it will execute that as a different test. Once everything is done, or all the test cases are over, the teardown is being called. Now, in Appium, how uh, the particular Appium client interacts with the device is through something called as a driver. A driver would contain the capabilities which you give. The capabilities is basically the uh, defining factor of a particular device. So suppose you would want to run on a Samsung device. It would it would have a unique ID, which is called a device ID, or in this case, UDID. You can give the UDID to specify this is the device that you want to run. And because you're running it on an Android device, you have to give the platform name as Android. If you're running it on an Android, uh, on an iOS device, you can just change Android to iOS and you can run the same test case. Now the automation name is what protocol uh, the Appium, Appium actually uses. So if I'm using UI Automator, that means it's trying to run on an Android device. And if it's XCUI test, it'll be running on an uh, iOS device. I'm keeping it very short because we, we, don't, we don't have much time. Now the platform name is Android. I have two platforms over here. Let's remove one. Now the app package and app activity are is used so that you can auto launch a specific application uh, using the whole script itself. So suppose you're trying to test out a uh, test the uh, uh, particular script on the settings app. So the settings app has two components. One is the app package, which is essentially the app name. And the app activity is what activity has to be launched during that particular test case. So in this test case, in this particular scenario, I'm just launching settings app and it will go to the home page of the test settings app. That's com.settings.settings. Now, once the capabilities are set up, you would have to connect that particular uh, script to the device, right? That's where the web driver URL comes in. Now, the web driver URL would contain the IP in which the device sits in and the port in which the device is connected to. So in the in using those two combination, you can connect the particular script to that particular device. So in the example of the, in, in this particular example, that is the Appium server, you, you saw that there are two components over here. One is IP, that's 0, 0.0.0. .0. And the second one would be the port, which is 424723. So once these this is given to that particular uh, script itself, you can run your script and the, or I'm sorry, the driver itself would contain the address in which the device sits in and the capability, which is the defining factor of what you're trying to run on that particular device. Now, once those are set up, you can use the driver with the help of the web driver agent to run uh, to run any specific commands on the particular on that particular on the device. So in this case, you can see self dot driver is generated here. Options has UI automated two options over here, and it's loading the capabilities uh, using the load capabilities function. And caps are the capabilities which I've set over here. I also have three additional capabilities which are headspin specific ones. So any vendor uh, such as headspin, we can have our own capable mapping capabilities which you can use. The capture capability is something that we use so that you can run the test case and get the data or the device KPIs and control lock. Is another capability wherein even while you're executing the test case, you can still interact with the device. Now, once that's done, I'm calling the driver over here. And here I'm using webdriver dot remote, and I'm using the hub and the web uh, the URL as well as the options which contains the capabilities to uh, create the driver. Now I have another uh, program. I have another function which is called a session ID, which is basically trying to get the Appium ID for that particular test scenario. And at the, at the very end, I'm using self dot wait. So this is a function of, of this is actually a selenium function, which waits for a particular amount of time uh, for the element to be searched or the element to be looked at. 
you can use app in driver and android driver that's completely fine i'm just showing a simple example it's a mixture of both selenium and uh app in my in this particular case case yeah yeah that can be uh, used as well app in driver and android driver does work now okay now we'll start up one of the test cases now here i am trying to uh, find an element using uh, i'm or i'm trying to use uh, trying to find an element called as connections using ui automator which is another function of appium by i'll show how that works over here so these are some of the devices that we have right you can start up any device with the appium inspector loaded to the side as well by using the drop down menu over here and selecting edit appium capabilities now if you're trying to connect a local device you can use the appium inspector as well which you can download. It's open source. You can just Google app, uh, Appium Inspector and you can directly download from the Appium website. And Headspin, you can uh, direct, uh, we have the inspector already loaded up. And these are the default caps that we've used for the device, the Samsung device over here. And when I click on start control session, in a minute or two, it will load up the device with the Appium Inspector ordered to the site. Now, while this loads up, I'll talk about how the test actually looks like. Now, in this variable, the connections, I'm using self.wait, which essentially I've set, which I've set up in the setup uh, part of the script, which has a 30 minute wait time. So it will check for an element that's presented over here for a, a 30 seconds. If it doesn't find an element, it'll give you a traceback error saying that the element was not found. Then I'm using until ec.presence of uh, element located. Now, ec is an expecting condition. Now, here you can use presence of element, which essentially means when the app in the server finds out that an element is loaded up, it'll, it will give that particular uh, element ID to the uh, variable over here, and you can start interacting with it. There's another capable, there's another uh, condition called as wait for element to be visible. That means even though the element is loaded up, the actual button or the actual element might not be visible on the device itself. So it will wait until the tag called as visibility uh, becomes true and only then will the element id be given to that particular function let's see if the device is loaded up okay so this is how the inspector looks like so here you can see this is a settings app because i've given the app pack is an app activity for the settings so over here the settings app launched now you can in get any element strategies over here so i've used connections right when i click on connections you can see the selected element over here you can see there are different buttons like tap you can use send keys this is majorly used to send values to a particular function like if you want to search for an element you can just click on search and you can type in the element that you want over here and it will send that particular value to that particular to that element now when you go down you have different methods over here so displayed is what i was talking about when i meant if the uh, element is visible so once displayed is true only then will that particular element ID be taken into effect. Now you can use different methods to get an element. You can use XPath over here, which is basically the app source over here. So each element has a different class. So in this particular element, which I've selected, just right over here, it's under something called as widget dot relative layout, which again is under linear layouts, which is again under something called as recycle view widgets dot recycle. So the XPath would use a common uh, use a common class name called as android.widget.textView and it's using an identifier called as resource ID. So an identifier has to be unique so that the web driver can find that particular element in the list of elements. So if you're, suppose if you're using class name as an example to find an element, the class name is very common. So if I just copy this class name android.widget.textView and search for it using class name over here, you will end up seeing there are a 16 matches for that particular uh, class name over here. That means whenever you just click on, whenever you just uh, add the variable find element by class name and give class name android widget dot widget text view, this is the element it will try to click on, which might not be connections. It could be any other element. Now, to avoid this, you have to find something unique. So in my case, what I've done is I've used UI Automator, which is again an Android uh, app in base tool with wherein you can use the text out text input of that particular element. So here you can see connections is present. Now, if I go back to the code and copy only the path, 
the UI automator is. And when I search for this particular element, you can only you'll, you'll see there's just one, sorry. So there's just one element over here and that's connections. And when I click on tab, it will click on the connections tab. Over here. So that's why I've used UI Automator over here. But instead of UI Automator, you can also use something called as resource ID as well. We can check that. If I just copy resource ID and search for the same thing in ID over here. There are again six more elements. So you can directly use uh, you are automated to, or you can even use XPath as well. That's totally fine. XPath in some scenarios can vary. So it's not, uh, it, it's also a bit slow as well because it has to go through all of the parent uh, uh, parent, uh, parent functions just to reach that particular element over here. So here, there's just one element. So you can use that. Now, once I've got, uh, once I've received that this is the element that I want to use or want to interact with, I've added this to the, a variable called as connections, and I'm using the dot click function just to click on it. Once that's done, I've kept a print element over here just for me to find to know that okay, the connections has been clicked, and I can go to the next method that is Wi Fi button. So once I click on that, I will just tap on it, it will take me to the next page over here, which is a connection page. Once the APM reloads, I just want to find out if uh, that particular page is loaded up. Now, whenever you're writing a script, I've seen a lot of people making the mistake wherein once a click has happened, uh, you, you are, you're not really verifying if that particular page has loaded up. To do that, you can click on any one of uh, unique, I mean, unique element over here, get the variable like uh, text or resource ID over here, copy that particular element, and just add another variable called as Wi-Fi button over here. And it will wait until this particular the Wi-Fi button is loaded up and only then will it uh, interact with it. Uh, otherwise, what will happen is you'll be clicking on it. In some cases, rare cases, Appium server wouldn't really, uh, it might have clicked on it, but the page might not have uh, gone to them. It might not have gone to the next page. So other actions that you perform uh, after the click wouldn't be act wouldn't be executed and you'll end up having a fail script. To avoid that, you can just add another variable called as Wi-Fi button, and you can just add the variable over here, and only if this was visible, it will go to Wi-Fi dot click. You can also, uh, okay, I uh, forgot to mention this. Instead of having connections uh, in one variable and connections dot click in, in, in another line, you can directly run you, the dot click function over here as well. If I just type in dot click, it works the same way. But this, uh, again, defeats the purpose if that particular page is not loaded up or not. You, you wouldn't actually know that. So that's why I've added into another variable, and I've used that variable and used dot click as another function. Okay. Now, once that's done, I'll just print out, okay, the Wi-Fi settings is opened up, and I'll just wait for three seconds because there is an animation that occurs when the button is being clicked. So if I just click on it, you'll see it'll take a few seconds for the Wi-Fi to actually load up and it changes from the off to the on function. So, so that's why I've kept a three second wait over here. And I click on it again and it'll just turn the Wi-Fi back on. So that's pretty much how we can write a simple script. And I'll leave it, I'll show you how we can execute the same script on the device as well. Now I'll just turn this off. I can see there are a lot of pistons. Uh, I'll actually uh, answer most of them after the uh, and during the QA, QA session. Okay, so this is how we can interact and use the app inspector to get the elements, and this is how we can write the script. Now, going back to the slide. Now, once uh, I, I've also talked about how the WebDriver URL and the capability list is, right? So, for a remote device, you need the IP of that particular device as well as the port so that you can connect it to the device and run your automated test cases over here. So in this example, I've used uh, the system variables, uh, sysdot uh, argument one and sysdot argument two. So I'll show you how that works and how we can use the device ID and the uh, web drive URL to run the test cases over here. Now, uh, if you look over here, 
I've actually used UDID as another variable. So set dot UDID is the system argument. So I've kept that arg uh, that variable over here. And I've also used default values. So because I'm using UDID, Appium would ignore a device name over here. So you can pretty much give a default name over here. So it's fine. And because I'm using the script only to run Android devices, I've given the automation name as UI automate. If you'd want to run iOS, you can write a small uh, if else uh, function over here so that whenever you're passing an argument called as Android, it will use your UI automator and platform name as Android and app and app -act it. If it's iOS, it will use uh, automation name as XUI test case, as XUI test, platform name is iOS, and instead of app package and app activity, it will use the bundle ID. Now, to run the test case, since I, I have Python 3 installed and I also have the Appium Python client set up as well. So I'll call Python 3 and the test case name is basic Appium. without API. I have different scripts written. So one is with API and one is without. So once, I've, once I'm going to execute the test case, there are two variables that I have to give to the script. One is the UDID of the device, which you can get from the platform like so. Let's go to devices. So suppose I'm going to run the test case on a device that's in London, for example, and it's a Galaxy S20 FE. So it's a Samsung device. So it will run the test case. So this is the you date of the device. Now, to make it easier, I'll just bring up the automation file so that you can see all of the capabilities. So here we have the UDID of the device. I'll copy this, paste this. Now I have to give a second variable as well, which is the hub URL. So this is called as, which I've given it to self.url over here. So you can see there's the driver is being called over here in line number 30. And the web driver dot remote is using the URL over here. And I'm using options, which essentially contains the capability list over here. So I'll copy the hub URL over here and paste it terminal. And I'll just click on it. Now, in a few in a few seconds, you'll be able to see that the icon that's which has start on, on it will change from the blue icon that you see over here to a magnifying glass icon with the stop icon as well. So like so. And when I click on this, you'll be able to view the test run. I've used sleeps here and there so that you'll be able to view that particular test case. Now here you can even see the Appium logs running once the test case starts. And you can even use the Appium inspector over here so that even during the test case, you can scan elements and write your own script. Now you, you can even see on the very top, there's also a small icon. It looks like a camera icon. So okay, the test is really quick because there's pretty much no actions over here. It opened the settings app, it clicked on connections, and it toggled the Wi-Fi on and off. And when I, when I go back to the script, you can see the all the print commands are uh, have already executed, and you even get a session URL. Now you must be wondering what the session URL is, right? So in the test, once the test case is written in Hetzman, that is using the capability Hetzman uh, capture. It, create, it generates a session URL which uh, showcases all of the device KPIs and the network level logs if you have an unprint version of that. An unprint version generally means that the network logs wouldn't be restricted. So once that's done, I can just directly click on this particular script and it will take me to the recorded session. If And you can also get all of the recorded sessions in the performance tab over here as well. Takes a few seconds to load, and this is the test which I've run. So now, and when I click on the waterfall UI, it takes me to the session over here, and you can see the entire test case video over here. You can see on what device and where exactly the test case ran on, and you can even see the app and commands used and the foreground and as a background activity as well. So this is how the test went. So it clicked on connections over here. This is out. Click on connections, it clicked on the wiper toggle over here and waited for three seconds and turned the toggle back on. As you can see, once all the data is loaded up, there are a lot of insights and even a lot of KPIs that are measured and plotted over here. So you can get the video metrics of that particular device. You can see the net CPU usage, you can see where exactly it spiked. So it was stable, it was idling at the 8% mark over here, but when the app actually loaded up, 
you can see there was a spike of 80%. And then again, it went to idle because it is a system. And whenever any actions are taken uh, are done, you can see small variations in the whole device KPU. You can see there is a lot of information that you can capture with just a 30 second run over here. And these are the insights into those particular sessions. I can even show you a different metric wherein the network details are also captured. This is an example of a network related metric. And these are all of the issue cards that occur, like loading animations. If there is any loading animation that come across the a particular application, we measure that. And you can even see the methods, slow downloads, and even slow sets. And that's pretty much it. So any questions that you might have, we can talk about them right now. Just bring up the keyword panel. OK, so Mohammed asks why web driver, web driver is imported, right? So uh, that's a small mistake from my end. I could generally use, uh, I, we, I, could, I could have just used the app and driver or the Android driver. But I've uh, written the script a while back, so I, I missed that part. So that's pretty much it. You can use app and driver and Android driver. That's totally up to you. Now, uh, should you turn on app server while running tests on Hitspin? So uh, the Appium server is majorly used so that you can run your test cases on a local server. So if you're if you're running a test case uh, connected onto a MacBook, right, like what I'm doing right now, you need to use the, the server. But when you're running it on an Android device, on uh, the Hitspin devices, it's already uh, set up in the host, so you can directly run the script from anywhere. Now, is Python the only language supported? No, uh, it is cross-platform. You can use Java, JavaScript, Ruby, any, any language as long as it has an Appium client in it. Can install an app on the Hitspin device. That's actually a good question. So you must be wondering, since you are using an app pack as an app activity, how can you run it on a, an application that you want to test out? You can either install it or use another capability called as Hitspin app.id, wherein you can upload the app onto the platform and you can use the app key as a capability. It will look something similar. It will look something like this. ID and instead of test, it will be an alpha key, something like this. Okay, instead of a uh, system install app like settings, how can I use my API? That's basically the same question. So uh, suppose you'd want, I can actually show it to you as well. So in this example, if I'd want to install an app, like suppose on this particular device, I can just go to the app section on the right hand side and I can just click on browse and it will upload any app that's on my system onto the device. So it's pretty straightforward. And once it's installed, you can use the app activity and app package of that particular device of that particular application and get it and run your test case over here. And if you do want to see any app packages, you can directly run shell commands on the device. So if I just type in PM packages so you can see the list of packages uh, okay next would be uh do you use appium one in your demo it seems so does your yes we do support appium 2.0 you can even check that as well so in automation this is the driver url that i was using so i can actually show you how what are the versions we support so we do support app in 2.0, 1.1, 1.22, .1, and the default is app in 2 over here. And you can even uh, use another capability called as it's an app version. Okay. Uh, so this is how that could look like. And you can give the app version right over here as a view. Any version as long as it's installed. Uh, was the AI integrated part? Uh, I'm not sure if you saw that over here. So whenever you run a test case on the devices that we have, it generates issue cards over here. So loading animation, it uh, might seem it, it might be a repetitive action, but in right now, it's not just a single. Uh, what do you call a loading wheel that comes up? It can be the logo, it can be some other thing. So it manages to figure out where exactly that hap that occurs and marks those particular location. We also have uh, like real hung methods, any uh, methods that take a certain amount of time would be captured. Duplicate messages can be seen over here. 
So whenever you do a black box testing kind of scenario, it will capture those issues over here. And you will even get insights into how that can be fixed. How are we getting the session ID? Great question. So in Python, the general command is to use driver.session ID. In Java, it's driver.get session, get session, I think. So every language has a small variant. It's basically driver dot get session ID or driver dot session ID versus script uh, script used. It's been a sticky repeat. Uh, again, good question. So the script itself is in on my laptop. The only thing that I've installed is the app in client, and I am running the script basically using the capability and the hub URL over here. There's nothing else that's needed. Uh, the uh, app in server is already in the host and it's been. If you don't have a proxy and if it's a normal network connection, you can run the script on your lap on laptop and just directly execute it. Okay. Uh, next is, can I run tests in parallel? Let's say I want to run on four threads on both iOS and Android platform. At the same time, is it possible to use Hitspin? Maybe some in uh, queue mechanism. Okay, uh, again, a good question. Uh, so we actually have something called as a load balancer URL that you can use. So in this example, I've used the host URL. So the host URL separates Android and iOS devices and it separates the devices based on the location there. Instead, you can use something like this, which essentially connects to all the devices at once. And you can even use uh, another capability called as a Hitspin selector, which essentially, so suppose you'd want to run on uh, four Samsung devices. You can use a selector over here. Use, instead of a device SQS, you can use manufacturer and you can just give it Samsung. And if you want to run it on a mix of both iOS and Android, uh, you don't have to run a selector to pick up all the devices, uh, the best available, the most available devices over here. And if you have a specific criteria, like you want to run it on an iPhone 11 and on an S20 FE, you can use device SQS as S20 FE, and you can use the Aura operand and use device SQS again with iPhone 11 as well. So uh, the only thing is that you just have to make sure the cap there are two capabilities which you are, uh, so that it runs both on Android and iOS. Can we do the installation of our app on Hitspin device programmatically? Also, will it be required to install for every individual? Uh, again, uh, that's, uh, so what you can do is, we have a documentation section over here. So I think I'll show that, so it will be much more clear. So we have something called as app management, wherein you can use an API to upload just one API, APK. So if you have multiple APK files, so you can uh, configure that in your script as well. So you can use something called as upload an app API over here, be it an IP or APK file, you can run this. You get a response uh, like an app.id, uh, an app ID, which is, uh, which is the example that I've given you prior to this. And you can use this as a capability, so whenever, you run the script using this particular capability on any device, it installs that app on that particular device. Uh, okay. Next is app.id is okay to use for Android APK, but for iOS, how will it trust? The trust certification, you will still have to uh, do it yourself. So whenever you run the test case, you install the app and you have to go to settings, do the trust part, and then you'd have to come back if it is a unsigned app. But if you, you, we always give the UDDs of the uh, iOS devices for you. So you can add it to your developer account. And once uh, you build an IP with that particular account, you wouldn't need to trust it. And if you, and again, it only is, it's, it only work, it only have the effect is only for enterprise applications. If it's not an enterprise application, that's not an issue. Okay, I'm a little late. Uh, are these devices connected to the same? So are they registered to the Hitspin dashboard somehow? I see you're running the script from the laptop and specifically the UDD. Now laptop, I'm trying to understand what the URL is. Okay, the URL is used to connect that particular uh, a script to the host. Now, uh, an example is, so suppose let me see if there are devices on the same host. So I think that will make it much more clear. Okay. So let's take an example of these are multiple devices. Okay, so uh, let's take an example of these four devices. All these four devices are attached to the same host. So that means uh, all the uh, base URL would be the same for these devices. So it's 9095, uh, Palo Alto 5 over here. If I go to the next one, it'll be it's a different host. These two are the same. This is 7026. If I open this, 
This is also 7026. So these two are in the same push. So how H1 works is, uh, I'll just bring up the P box over here. Now in the P box, there will be three separate hosts. It could be two Linux or uh, three Linux hosts. And each Linux host would have its own web drive, uh, web drive URL. Now in each Linux host, you can connect up to eight devices. So all eight devices would have the same host URL. But if you can always use the uh, web drive, uh, the load balancer you are as well, so it will connect to all the devices at the same time. So that's why. I hope that answers your question. Is Headspin tool available to use task free? Uh, I'm afraid not. So this is an enterprise tool, so there would uh, you would have to pay for it. Now our tests run for eight hours on a single mobile device. Would you support that? Also, can we run back to back tests on devices? I'm guessing we support private devices. Can you talk about your cost model? Cost model. I'm sorry, I'm not the person to talk about that, but you can run uh, eight hour long test cases, regression test cases are supported. So you, you can even uh, connect a device and run uh, stress tests like ADV monkey commands as well. That's totally fine. And you can run back to back test cases on it. So we have a queuing method. So we have something all as uh, wait for device available uh, capability, wherein if you're running a test case, uh, like a 10, five minute test case, and you are running like four uh, test cases at the same time and you only have one device. It will wait for this amount of time for the next uh, test case to execute on the device. But if the device is left unattended. So uh, we have a 10 minute limit, but you can always, uh, no, we have 10 to 15 minute limit, I think you can change that according to your uh, preference. If it's a private pool for shared pool, I think it's like 10 to 20 minutes. And I ha I'll have to uh, check that, I'm really sorry. Now, uh, do we get new device for every individual TC if I am launching a new session for SK, sorry, the test case, or will my device be the same? And once the app is installed on the test case, do I need to install it again? Uh, again, a good, a good question. So for private devices, you can install the uh, application and it would stay there if device cleaning is not turned on. For public devices, each time you uh, run the test, it would you would need to install the uh, device because uh, privacy because of privacy reasons. Yeah. There are multiple people using same device, right? So that's why. Is there a headspinistic API to use in automation to get any insights data automatically? So that's where the uh, capability headspin capture comes in. <laughs> so once capture is turned on, so this is how the capture API uh, capability is. Once this is turned on, whenever you run the test case on the devices that we have, we give you the we give you the insights, and in the documentation we have a session API wherein you can use curl commands to uh, get all of the information from it. So you can download all of the capture session data. A biometric is even support for React Native APK. Now, uh, the biometric uh, application is majorly used to see uh, just as a, a a true false. It's a true false mechanism. So you have to get the SDK on, uh, in your application itself, and then build your app over it. Uh, will it support on React Native app APK? I think so. I'm not 100% sure on that. Yeah. Let, I can actually check that right now. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not really sure on that. If it's uh, working on a React Native app. Uh, it should, I 90%, I'm practically sure it would work on it. Okay, uh, any other questions? Do we have a report gen uh, generation whenever a text is inserted or a patch? So, uh, yes, we have something called as a dashboard, which again has alerts in it. So, let me try to bring one up. So the dashboard is a graph. It's a Grafana based dashboard that we have. It's inbuilt, it's inbuilt into the UI. So whenever a test session is added uh, or synced to the database, it is directly visible over here. You can see the test pass failure rate over here. I'm just showing you an example dashboard. So you can pretty much configure it to however you, whatever seems fit for you. And it's basically connected to our database over here, and you can use any simple Postgres 
SQL to get this. And you, you also have another tab called alerts. So whenever you set up a threshold, you can get the alert from there. Order the black box issue. Okay, uh, actually no. So it depends on the deployment model. So uh, if the black box, which is called the P box, is essentially used in all of our data centers. So if it's a cloud, uh, if it's a cloud, uh, arrangement that means you you can just tell us which devices that you want and we'll procure them and set up set that up over at the DC and you can just use the UI directly. You don't have to get the P box. The P box can also be uh, used in a on prem setup as well. So whenever if you have if you're like a uh, a bank as an example, data is uh, a major concern, right? So you can have it in your own network. You'll have your own blade server and only someone that's connected to that particular network can get access to the devices. Uh, data, can you elaborate on this? Now, a step-by-step -step data in the sense, like if you'd want to suppose uh, have a, a test scenario, well, you have a test scenario where you'd want to check the login launch and suppose the sign out functionality. In those scenarios, you can use something called as labels over here. So I have example labels generated. So you can use timestamps whenever the test case is added, and you can use those timestamps like so. You can use user or page load request. These are all of the different APIs that we have. And suppose uh, it's the login method that you'd want, and you want to see the parameters of the net CPU usage when the device is logging. So you can just type in uh, login or startup. Uh, as sample and this is the login method. When I click on submit, it generates a label over here, and you can use the same label uh, to actually get all of the device level KPIs extracted onto suppose the dashboard. Uh, for cloud client, uh, again, uh, the uh, fee structure is not something that I you know about. Any technical questions that you might have, I am always, but you can always reach out to any one of our sales. Uh, uh, or anyone any, or to our sales team and they can get back to you. Uh, so Aburo, if you can uh, give the data, uh, details of the sales team, I think uh, they would uh, be able to contact them if that's okay. So we just have like 10 more minutes, anything else? Is there a way to have PUC set up on that? Uh, yes, there is a way. So uh, you can reach out to our head our team, let me just uh, check how we can actually reach out. I think you can just log into the Headspin UI and directly get the details from there. Let me just make sure. Yeah, you can use, uh, you can just uh, log into the Headspin UI and use Connect now. Someone, our sales team will get reach out to you. It's been dot and you can use connect now over here. How to install all APK is there any capability? Yes, there is. So uh, while you can install using app.id, we have a dedicated list of capabilities over here. You can either use the curl command uh, uninstall to do uh, and use app.id over here, or there is something called as remove app packages. You can use this capability, give the list of app pack uh, packages that you want to install, and it will uninstall them. Now, do we get this record function for reference review purposes? 
during the POC, I think you will be able to, uh, if you, uh, when you get a POC environment set up, you can get the uh, session reference. Uh, can we easily export test data in a program? Yes, you can. So whenever we have a session recorded, everything is synced directly to our replica DB. So you can use any DB viewer to access the data. So you can pretty much get it. And we even have a way to get that as well in performance. Over here, so this is a replica DB, so you can use the control to that. Now, can you please share the idea how it could be possible to indicate? It? Okay, uh, so because we use the hub URL and the UDID or capability list, you can directly use. Suppose if you have Git, uh, GitLab as we we'll use GitLab as an example, you can write your code over there and you can set a path for the particular script and use a bash code to run the same as A3 pipeline. There's no direct integration, but you can, because it's all open source and it's using Appium, you can basically use any CICT to run the script. It's basically a mixer of bash code and the script itself. What's the security feature applied to protect customers in doing apps? So we, we are an SOC type two. We, we do have SOC type two certification over here. And every uh, device uh, or, in any uh, any person that logs into Hitspin would have their own token. So in this case, I've used my token over here to connect to the devices. So anyone that's recorded the session would practically run this particular test case. But if I just click on this, on the DPA token, you won't be able to run the test case now because this token is deleted and I have to generate a new one. And only then can you actually run the test. Even just, uh, so suppose if it's private cloud, it's very secure because no one would have access to it because the login needs uh, your company domain email address for you to access the devices and everything is token based. So if you think that one of the token has been uh, is missing or someone is abusing it, you can just uh, click on clear token and that's it. You won't be able to run the test case. Okay. We are almost uh, out of time now. We have like six more minutes. Any, any other questions? Yes, uh, public devices are routinely claimed. So suppose you've installed an app on one of these devices. We have something called as a device cleaner API that kicks in. So uh, how it works is, so you have a token, right? So whenever you install it on one of the devices, you can run the test case on that particular device. And whenever another token or uh, Whenever, whenever someone else that has another token opens a device, it will clear the device. So there won't be any applications installed. So any builds that you've installed would be missing. And whenever you up, and you must be thinking if you upload an uh, app, uh, would someone else be able to access the same app? They, they would not because it's again using a token to retrieve the app data. Now for, for performance to be captured, we need to use capture capability or it does, right? You have to use the capture capability. Uh, this is uh, designed so that if you have a very large test case and because the capture takes around uh, 10 to 30 seconds, it between those time, uh, you need, it, it takes a, a, you need that particular time period to actually record all of the data. Right? So some uh, people that just want, uh, just want to see the results in a test manual tool, they prefer not to have the capture uh, as a capability. So that's why we have it. And we need to add it as a capability or use the uh, curl command to turn it on. I guess there uh, aren't no, any more questions. So I'll just end the webinar over here. Thanks for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to everyone. So you can always reach out to uh, Headspin by going into the website and just clicking on connect now. And if you have any queries or if you'd want to do a POC with us, you just have to ping us. And more or less, I'll be the one who will be connecting with you.